cultural aspects of living in Japan. And then as we have time afterwards, I'd look, like to look into God's Word and to talk just a little bit about how we share our faith with people who have different backgrounds than us from the, uh, the book of Acts. So as you see there, we are Thompsons to Japan, and we were serving in a city called Iwatsuki, Japan. And that was about 20 miles north of Tokyo. So if you were at Tokyo Station, we were about 20 miles northeast of Tokyo Station. And really, the Tokyo metropolitan area is a large area, and it extends all the way to the mountains. We have about 40 million people living in that area. Uh, the background there, it's kind of hard to see. It was actually a Buddhist temple near our house, just a couple train stops down. And so that is what that picture is. Here is a picture of our family. Uh, this is a picture from Shichigo-san. So when kids are seven, five, and three, they get special pictures, kind of like if you remember, I don't know if they did that down here in the south, but the old Olin Mills family photos. This is a Japanese version of that. So you get dressed up in a kimono and your family gets a picture. Of course, I am the one in the center there. My wife, Emily, is to the right. And then our son, Shiloh, is in first grade, just moving into second grade in Japanese school. And our daughter, Eliana, was in, uh, is in kindergarten there in Japan. So here's a picture of Japan. It's obviously in East Asia off the coast of Korea and China and a little bit up into Russia. So as you're looking at that map where you see that little train is Iwatsuki. And so that's where it would be in relation to the country as a whole. If you're looking at Tokyo, so this is kind of a map of the metro, metropolitan area. You can kind of see that um, no matter what city you're in, you have those loops for the highways. And we were just south of the third loop there. And that's where Iwatsuki is in relation to Tokyo. Where the word Tokyo is would be kind of downtown Tokyo area. Um, here is Bethel Baptist Church. When we went to Japan, obviously we could not speak the language and we didn't understand the culture that we were entering into. So our goal was to minister alongside some senior missionaries in an existing church work. And I'll get to the goals related to that in just a second. So there was our church building. It was a former electric company that we got at a good discount uh, for the property and we moved in. And you notice something there kind of right in the, in the foreground of the church, and that's the bicycles. So while we were in Japan for the last four and a half years, that was our mode of transportation. So you see two with child uh, seats on those. That's what we rode around town. We did not have a car for the last four and a half years, so I'm getting used to driving again, that on back state side. This is our church family. This was a recent photo. Um, I believe this one was New Year's. I'm trying to remember a Christmas time frame. And my parents were there visiting us. So you see me in the right and Eliana, I think Emily's not in this photo because she was in the back helping some of the ladies uh, with the, the meal prep. And we, have, we run about 30 in our services. They're actually just getting ready while I'm here to transition over to a young national pastor. Um, he's in the foreground there with his son uh, with the birthday hat on. And in Japan, 30 people is an average church size. That's a good sized church uh, for Japan. So these are the senior missionaries here, Joe and Noni Mita, who mentored us. They are Japanese nationals, which was very helpful because uh, they had insight into the, uh, into the culture that we did not. He's an ambassador grad. I'm sorry, not an ambassador, a Tennessee Temple grad. So he experienced some of the U.S. culture and could help us with that. So we enjoyed ministering underneath um, them as they tutored us and, and trained us in what we needed to do and explained some of the things we encountered uh, and this is a Japanese yakuniku, so you grill your meat right at the table. It's one of the favorite meals of our family there in Japan. So what were our first term goals as we headed to Japan? When we were here with you, I think it was eight years ago at this point. It's been a long time. Uh, we mentioned we had some ter first term goals going into it because you always want to set goals for your ministry uh, to make sure you get it. And they were to learn the Japanese language, to learn Japanese culture, and then to learn to minister in a Japanese context. And as time allowed, find a new city and start a Bible study. Our, our heart's desire is to start a new church work there in the Tokyo metropolitan area. The Japanese people are the second largest of the unreached people groups. If you go to Joshua Project and you sort it by population, the unreached people groups, you'll find that Jap Japanese is the second largest of those unreached people groups. Less than 1% worldwide uh, know Christ as Savior. And I think a lot of those that do know Christ actually reside here in America. So it's even smaller there. I think 0.3 is the, the listed evangelical population in Japan. So lots of opportunities for ministry and church planting. So the first thing we did was obviously to learn the Japanese language. And today I'm going to give you a brief Japanese language lesson. So on the right there are the four scripts you'll find all over ja Japan. Of course, you already know one of those, and that would be the top one, right? Everybody can read my name, hopefully. That's Aaron. And in Japan, they call that Romaji. 
Obviously, the Roman alphabet, Romaji, it comes from that. The one down from that is actually my name as well, so you can read it even though you didn't know you could. And that's Aaron written in hiragana, and that would be the phonetic way that they spell out the bottom, which is the kanji. The one down from that is also my name, Aaron, so you can read that as well, and that's katakana, and that's what they, for foreign words, they write in that particular script. And then the bottom one is the real tricky one. It's kanji. You probably know of that. The Japanese borrowed it from China, so the Chinese written system. And that's my name in kanji. I picked it. Obviously, my mom didn't give me that name. Um, it's Aaron, and it's to love a love discourse. And somebody actually gave that to me because they said, as you're here, you're going to be explaining the love of Christ to others. And so your name can be love discourse. And actually, the name Aaron in the Hebrew means light bringer. So I think it's a very apt name. So there you go. I'll give you a quiz at the end, see if you can reproduce all those, my name and the different scripts. Um, so one of the challenges for missionaries, obviously, is to learn that language so that we can minister effectively. In Japan, it takes a little bit longer. We did a two-year language school. My wife and I, we kind of, um, I went first, and then she went after me, and we continued to practice that. And actually, below learning Japanese is how you say that in Japanese, Nihongo no benkyo. So that's what we did for a good part of that. Here's a picture of what we saw for two years. Um, kind of the, the nitty-gritty of being a missionary, we went to language school and we would learn every day and then we would go home and we'd study some more to try to get it all in. But we had some good opportunities even at language school to minister. There's a very broad international community. We had them over for Christmas parties and different things like that where we could share the gospel with them. So even language school provided us some opportunities for ministry. And if you think Japanese is hard, it is hard. It's harder than you could ever imagine and there I am. Uh, with, my, with my translator trying to figure out our daughter's uh, kindergarten uh, December announcement sheet. So if you can imagine trying to figure that out as you read through it. Um, but that was a good um, help for us because it prepared us for what we wanted to do, which is to obviously read and share God's word. And that's a picture of the Japanese Bible there. And you can go on our display table afterwards and look at that if you'd like to take a look at what that looks like. So as we became fluent in the language, or as we grew into fluency, obviously it provided more opportunities uh, to minister among the Japanese people there at the church and for evangelism and discipleship. And I just put these side by side. This is Jesus Loves Me in English, which hopefully you can read. And then on my left, should be your left as well, is Jesus Loves Me in Japanese. So uh, we were able to sing both of those by the end, obviously, of our time there. And this is Emily Holden, I think she was leading the kids' music that day. And the ultimate goal, obviously, was to be able to preach in Japanese, uh, as well as to hold Bible studies. And here I am, just before we came back, preaching a message in Japanese that, obviously, uh, the Lord gave me the grace to be able to write and to preach. And so we got to the level that we wanted to, linguistically. Now, whenever you minister cross-culturally, obviously, you're learning the language, but there's a little bit of a a danger in learning a foreign language, and that is that you think you know what you know, but sometimes you really don't. And so we encountered something like this all over Japan. So as you're preaching, you hope this is not your experience. So when we were at a restaurant in Japan, this is what we came across, and you'd find English like this all over Japan because they enjoy English. They learn it in schools, and you'll see it on in t-shirts. And I think as you read that, you can understand what it means, but it's not really supposed to be written that way. So I think what they were trying to say is when you're tired, it's best to take, you know, take a load off or, or to rest but it says, best to the rest slowly when tired. So hopefully you can understand that. And that's what we don't want to have happen when we're preaching the gospel or um, evangelizing others. And that's why we spent so much time uh, studying, God's, uh, studying the language there. Obviously, the second thing we want to do is to learn Japanese culture. And even here in the States, you've probably experienced this, somebody from the north coming down to the south, or if you're from the south going up to the north, uh, things are done differently depending upon where you live. And obviously, there's a multitude of factors. Your family, the surrounding culture, even the weather can affect the way you do things. And so we wanted to understand Japanese culture because obviously the gospel doesn't change from America to Japan, but the way people think and the way you communicate that message will change from America to Japan. The illustrations you use, uh, those, those particular sins that really convict people and draw them to the Savior, you have to understand what they're struggling with um, spiritually, so that you can point them to the light of Christ. And so underneath that, it says Nihon no Bunka, and that's Japanese culture. And uh, that's our kids dressed up in traditional Japanese garb. Now, garb. Now there might be a misunderstanding here because we're in a bunch of pictures and kimonos. On your average, average, every day, everybody dresses like us, okay? So probably if there was a uniform in Japan, it would be what I'm wearing right now, suits. Men wear suits there in Japan. 
to work still, and it's probably the, the de facto uniform of Japan. Uh, but on holidays and special events, or if they're going to a festival, they will dress up in the traditional garb. Now this is a picture of a Shinto shrine. In Japan, there are two forms, uh, or two main religions that most people follow. Uh, this is Shintoism, the national religion of Japan. It's very animistic in nature. So each of these shrines will be associated with a spirit, uh, which in turn is associated with an aspect of nature. Uh, and most Japanese don't understand this. So if you were to ask them what the difference is between Shintoism and what comes next, Buddhism, they would know as much as you. So it's just, I'm Japanese, so I go to these festivals, I go to these shrines, much like maybe a Catholic would say, I'm Catholic, so I go to the to, you know, church on Easter, and they can't tell you anything about Catholic doctrine or what they believe. This is actually the shrine that was right across from our apartment. So as we looked at our apartment, you could see that. And Shinto shrines are everywhere in Japan. You can find them on grocery, sto grocery store rooftops, um, in people's backyards, just everywhere. And um, a lot of people will be associated in the community with one shrine, so you'll have a community shrine. And uh, this was the one for our community. In fact, our neighbor, who we eventually got to invite out for an English day camp and share the gospel with, his family was part of the, the group in charge of this particular shrine. And so it was exciting to be able to share the gospel with he and his wife. They had never heard the gospel before. So that was one of the delights of being a missionary there in Japan. This is also another Shinto shrine. It's the biggest one in our city, and it's actually just down the road from our church. So on particular holidays, especially New Year's, people will go there uh, for good luck. They'll receive like an arrow that's supposed to give you good luck for the year. And we would see them walking past our church as we were getting ready for Sunday school. And it was just a good reminder every day that when we went to church and went by it, that this is what we were trying to do. We were trying to save people from darkness and bring them into the glorious light of the gospel. Now this is in a city, a larger city near our house. That shrine that you just saw will have kind of one of these it almost looks like the Ark of the Covenant. It's not, obviously, but one of these like, boxes associated with each shrine, and on particular festivals, they'll get together and they'll march it around the city like they're marching their god around the city. And I think, hopefully the video will play here. I'm not sure if audio will play, but this was one uh, from our city near our house, uh, in a larger city. And so they'll march around, and it, obviously coming from America, we don't have idol worship out in public, although I've heard that there are some temples being built even here in Greenville, but this is something that you see very common, people just worshiping idols um, on a daily basis. This is that Buddhist temple I was telling you about at the beginning near our house. This is the other main religion in Japan. People say you're born Shinto, you're married Christian, I'll explain that in just a second, and you're buried Buddhist. And the reason why is Shintoism doesn't have really an afterlife with it. It's kind of about the here and the now and the spirits in the physical world, uh, but there's a lot of ceremonies related to birth and historically with marriage in the Shinto uh, shrines. And so people would go there for those particular events, and of course for New Year's holiday. And then married Christian, let me explain that. Recently, because of the exporting of American culture and movies, many Japanese girls want the traditional American wedding. And so you'll see these beautiful structures all over Japan. You'll think, wow, that's quite the church. But it's just a wedding hall. And they have those because people want that traditional American wedding. And they know nothing of Christianity, obviously, which is why we're there. And then you're buried Buddhist. The Buddhists have the graveyards all over uh, Japan. This is actually a practicing Buddhist temple, but most Buddhist, what you would call temples, are just really a graveyard. And what they do is they bury people and they charge them to have the family grave. And they're kind of in charge of the funeral home business there uh, in Japan. And so one of my daughter's classmates, uh, their mom is an English teacher, we got to know her, and their father was a high school, middle school teacher, but then he inherited the family temple, like the, the graveyard. So then after that, he, he, he converted to being a Buddhist monk. Um, and we kind of asked them, they didn't know much about Buddhism other than what they were supposed to do for those rites and ceremonies. And so if we were to define what is the religion of Japan, if you were to go to a website, you'd see Shintoism, Buddhism, most people practice that. But really it's nationalism. You are Japanese, and that's kind of your religion. And Shintoism and Buddhism are a part of that. And so that's a real struggle we face when we try to say, hey, when you come to Christ, it's an exclusive relationship with the God of heaven. Because they're more than happy to add one more thing on top um, to just kind of get their bases covered. But the exclusivity of Christ is something that often uh, will be a stumbling block to people there in Japan because it means giving up ancestor worship. They have an entire festival in the fall related to ancestor worship, going to your, the graveyard inviting your family back into your home, sort of like the Mexican Day of the Dead uh, in, in South America or in Mexico. 
So that's the Buddhist temple near our house. This is the largest Buddhist temple uh, in Japan. It's in downtown Tokyo. And people will go, before you enter temples, often you will cleanse yourself with smoke or with water on your hands. And that's seen as purifying so you can enter the temple. Of course, we know there's only one way that you can truly have your sins um, forgiven and purified, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. But here's a picture of people seeking to cleanse themselves uh, from their sin and their illness. They'll go in front of these cauldrons and, and wipe the smoke over them. Then they'll go from there to the water. Then they'll go worship in front of the shrine. They'll throw money in and say a prayer. And then on their way out, they'll get their fortune told. They have these little fortune sticks that tell your fortune. If it's a good fortune, you take it home. If it's a bad fortune, you tie it up and leave it there so it doesn't follow you home. And they'll also buy amulets. So if you've seen those beaded bracelets here in America, a lot of people wear them now. They kind of have like a marble bead on them. In Japan, those have significance because they're related to being protected uh, from evil spirits. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, if you don't know the difference between Shintoism and Buddhism, that's okay, because neither do Japanese people. This is one of the most famous sites in Japan in Nikko, and one of the former leaders of Japan had it built up in the mountains, and he actually mixed elements of Shintoism and Buddhism in one uh, temple. And so that's kind of what we deal with on a daily basis, is people who say, oh, no, I'm Shinto, or I'm Buddhist, my family is, and we say, well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know, we just go to the temple. Uh, and that provides us a good opportunity to share the gospel. Now, when most people think of Japanese culture, this is what they think of. Japan has imported a lot of cartoon characters, or maybe you've had sushi here around town. I'm seeing sushi places everywhere here uh, since last time I went. And people think of the culture as that. And that is part of the culture, and it does influence the way people think. But when we are in Japan, oh, sorry, there's a little video of the sushi there. This is what we think of Japan. Um, so this is the food we would eat on a regular basis, and they even mix some Western and um, Japanese food, you can see the kids' meal on the bottom right there where they mix chicken nuggets and french fries with sushi. That's something you'd see around town. The top right is your camp meal. So we have a Christian camp there. And when you go to camp, that's the meal you get for camp uh, we got when we were there. So top right, you get a lot of pickled vegetables, um, lots of veggies, and then shrimp and some other things. On the left, we have a meal after service every week at church as part of our fellowship. And on the left is curry and salad. And that's a common meal around Japan for your church luncheon. So I think tonight there's a carry-in dinner or something of that nature. Uh, we're planning on bringing some of that, Lord willing. So if you want to try it, you'll get a chance tonight to try some of that uh, curry and rice. Of course, they do have some of the American culture that they brought in. So you see my kids up there in Domino's attire. They got to go to Domino's and make their own pizza. We have Domino's. Of course, below that is McDonald's, Pizza Hut. After World War II, America rebuilt Japan, and we brought a lot of our culture with us. So most American restaurants you'll find there, and Japanese do love them. On the left is our Christmas dinner at church. And this is an interesting one. In Japan, the Christmas meal that everybody thinks of is pizza and fried chicken. Um, and there's some history behind that. Uh, KFC ran a really great promotion that has stuck in everybody's mind. Uh, and then they just think of those as American foods. And so Christmas is an American holiday, so that's what they have on, Ameri on American holiday. And they also have like a strawberry shortcake cake that they eat. And you can see that kind of in the foreground there with the strawberries. And so that's what we have. Uh, we do Christmas morning services. Since Christmas isn't a national holiday in Japan, people go to work. They don't meet up with their families. Instead, we come with our church family and we fellowship around a meal. And we have a special event there for the kids. And we invite people from the community in. It's a great opportunity to say, hey, this is what you've heard about Christmas. Here's Santa and all that. But let's tell you the real meaning of Christmas. Why do we celebrate Christmas? What does the word Christmas mean? And so Christmas is a huge outreach and inreach opportunity there in Japan. Of course, in Japan, the transportation is different. That was something that we had to get used to. And so you see the three modes of transportation that we utilized while we were in Japan. When the kids were little, we took them around in stroller. And the, the walk to church was about a mile, which was fine, unless it was raining. Then it was a little bit of a struggle. Uh, so you see the kids in their rain covers. Then we moved up to a bike. We thought we were really living. We had an electric bike. And there's our kids getting ready to go to church on the electric bike. Of course, trains are very prevalent there in Japan. Everybody uses those pretty much to go to school and work. Uh, and when you have a toddler, the trains introduce all sorts of new uh, hazards for them. So there's our daughter trying to lick the hand hold on the train. This was right before COVID, so people were not as cautious about things like that. But yeah, so that's the transportation there. And all of these things do affect people. So if you think of transportation, when you build a church here in America, you build a huge parking lot, and you're just kind of off of a road where people can get to you. When you're in Japan, you have to think about the pedestrians and the train people, right? So you need to build your church 
where there's a train station nearby that people can walk to. And you need to make sure you have covered bike parking at your church so that people who come with bikes on a rainy day don't go back out and their seat's all wet. And so those were some things that we didn't know before we went, and we're thankful that we were an existing church work. So now when we go and start our new church work, we'll have those things in mind uh, as we do so. Here's some other aspects of Japanese culture. So we saw some earlier, some cartoon characters that we all knew, maybe from childhood, especially the younger people in the room. In Japan, probably one of the most famous characters is in the top right. His name is Doraemon. And before we went to Japan, we didn't know who he was. Uh, but he's very influential in most children growing up. So it's helpful to understand who he is, and maybe you can pull some illustrations from who he is and what he does um, to relate to the kids when you're giving a kid's lesson. Uh, below that was a festival we had every year in our city, and those were kind of like a parade that they would march around the city, and it was just related to culture. It wasn't religious in our city. Uh, it was related to doll making and culture. But I thought that was interesting because it captures a good dynamic of Japanese culture. So you see those traditional garbs, and then you can see who's pulling the, the float, and that's a bunch of baseball kids. In Japan, baseball is king, and I think everybody's probably familiar with the name Shohei Otani at this point. Obviously, Japanese gentleman. Uh, who came over to play baseball. So baseball is a big part of the culture, and they play a lot of games on Sunday. So you have to be mindful of that, especially as you're getting your kids into sports. A lot of sports activities are Sunday. So the churches battle with their youth when they reach middle school and high school. A lot of kids will start into those sports clubs and activities, and they'll become absent from church. And so you have to keep that in mind and try to preach on priorities and, and why we come to church on Sundays instead of going to our games. And that's been a real struggle historically for the church. I took the picture on the left, or actually my wife did, because it's an interesting aspect of Japanese culture. It encompasses two aspects. One, you take your shoes off whenever you enter a building. And that's the entranceway to our church for a special event. Everybody was taking their shoes off. And then two, because that represents Japanese way of thinking. You notice how it's all organized and stacked the same way. And that's very much the way Japanese think. Everything needs to be organized and lined up and perfect. And they learn how to do that from a young age, from kindergarten all the way up. And so that's another thing to keep in mind uh, as you plan a church. They're very much into organization, time, and making sure everything's just proper. So as you do that in your church, you want to make sure that's not a stumbling block and keep everything flowing the way it should be. Um, and obviously, if you enter somebody's home, you want to make sure you're taking your shoes off because it will offend them if you walk in. Interestingly enough, I found this to be a very helpful uh, gospel illustration because in America, obviously, depending upon the home, you just wear your shoes right in, and it doesn't really matter depending upon your, your upbringing or where you grew up in, this, in the country. But in Japan, I say when I first came, I realized, oh, I have to take my shoes off at the entrance. And so I take my shoes off and then they give you slippers that you wear around the house for your guests. And so you wear those around the house, but then when you enter a bedroom that has like a straw mat, they call those tatami mats, you have to take your slippers off and walk in. And the idea historically has been you're not bringing dirt in, you're not bringing evil spirits in with your shoes. So I said, I didn't know that about Japanese culture, but here in Japan, that's the rule, so I follow it. And then I mentioned, you know, heaven is a country. It has its own rules about sin and who can enter. And then I go into the gospel on why uh, somebody who has sin can enter heaven and what God does to provide for that specific need in our life. So learning to minister in a Japanese context. When you have language and culture and you mash them together, now it's time to start ministering to the Japanese nationals. Hopefully you've learned enough language that you're not going to make that water bottle mistake we saw earlier. And hopefully you've learned enough culture so that you can communicate using illustrations from the culture and you don't offend the people to whom you minister. So here we are on Sunday morning getting ready to go to church, all geared up. And probably nobody cares, but that says, Nihon no kyokai de tsukairu koto manabu. It just means to learn how to minister in church. So here, I think this is a video. Oh, no, it's not a video on this one. So here I am in uh, ministering in a Japanese context. We are out planting sweet potatoes. That was something we did as a church. In Japan, sweet potatoes are the equivalent of apple picking. Every fall, communities go and they pick sweet potatoes. Uh, kindergartens go, people go, and so our church participated in that. And of course, I had never planted a sweet potato before. Growing up in the city, we had other things that we did with gardens. So that was part of learning how to minister in that culture. This is an important aspect of culture. How does it work? How do you set it up as a church? How do you get your church involved? How does this become a special outreach event? And I'm there uh, trying to get the, the soil ready to plant those. And that was actually our neighbor's yard who's unsaved. Uh, but through this and other things, we've had the opportunity to share the gospel with her. 
Now, how do you baptize somebody in Japan? Well, our church has a unique way of doing it. The gentleman who owned the property before us had installed a bathtub on his patio. We don't know why, but obviously it was God's plan because that has now become our baptistry. And while we were there in Japan, we saw two of our young people uh, make that commitment to Christ and be baptized. In Japan, baptism has a little bit more uh, of a connotation to it than it does here in America. Obviously, we preach very clearly that baptism does not save you, um, but we will not allow somebody to be baptized or enter the church who's still practicing idol worship. So they may have made a declaration of faith, but before they can publicly declare their faith, they have to come to be committed to Christ. And so that's it takes a long time for people to come to that point. We've had people in our church for several years who have made professions of faith come faithfully, but have not made the commitment to baptism because they don't want to say, I'm following Christ alone. And so that's a, was a unique aspect of the culture that I had not anticipated. Because here in the States, usually, especially if you're an adult, you get saved, you get baptized shortly thereafter to make that public profession. But we want to walk people through what does it mean to come to Christ. It's not something you can just add on top of your Shintoism and Buddhism. I took this picture because it represents a real struggle in ministry in Japan. This is a young couple in our church who came and were married in our church. It was the only marriage we had while we were there. In Japan, Christianity has historically been considered a woman's religion, a woman and child religion. Men work long hours, uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. sometimes each day, six days a week. And so they're very absent and they don't want to spend their Sundays coming to church. And so a lot of single women in Japan who are looking for spouses and they have to make a choice, and we lose some of our young women with this choice. Do I want to follow Christ and have the potential of being single for the rest of my life? Or do I want to marry an unsafe person? And often when they do that, they stop coming to church over a period of time. We also find that sometimes the man who's interested in them uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will come to church for a while, make some sort of a pressure of faith, they'll get married, and then he'll leave, and he will be absent for the rest of the time. And so it's a very, um, something that we have to think through uh, as we minister to the young people in our church because we want godly families uh, that are growing in Christ. Here I am teaching the Sunday school class. This would be what a Sunday school room looks like uh, there in Japan. And I helped out with the Sunday school class and ministered. Uh, one way we found uh, that we could connect with Japanese people was having them in our home. We were never... I shouldn't say that. I think twice we were invited into a Japanese home during our time there, and that was just so our kids could play in the yard. Um, Japanese don't really have you into their home. They're very private in that way, but they grow up learning English and seeing American culture, so they're very interested in seeing what an American home looks like. So you'll see them walk in and say hi to us, and then they'll start looking around to see what's different from where they're from. But we found that a good way to invite people over for meals. This is our church folk coming over for a fellowship. Emily's mom was in town, and she was able to uh, to give a testimony of what ministry in Brazil, her parents serve in Brazil, was like to the church ladies. But we have unsaved guys into the home, unsaved ladies into the home, and that's a great opportunity to minister. We pray before our meals, so I get a chance to explain why we pray before our meals. Uh, we usually do a Bible, like a kid's devotional after our meals, so they're there. We're going to pop out a kid's devotional and go through it. Um, and so it's been, we found that's been a great opportunity for ministry. Another great way for people uh, to get introduced to the church because they're very hesitant about church and Christianity, um, almost like you'd find people here in the States hesitant about cults, uh, was Christmas events. So in Japan, they don't have ovens, and because of that, they don't bake a lot. So Christmas cookie events, lots of people come out. They want to see what it's like to bake Christmas cookies. And then we were able to explain the gospel through Christmas to these people. And this is an event we had early on. So really in Japan, we find that we have two major ways of reaching out to people. Uh, the first one is Christmas events. People will come out in large numbers to Christmas events at our church, and that's a great opportunity to present the gospel. The other way is through English camps. Obviously, they're learning English through school, and they want to practice speaking their English. They're very good at reading it, but they're horrible at speaking it and understanding it. So they will come out, and we advertise this is an English Christian camp. We're going to give a Bible story, and they'll still come out. Um, and through that process, we'll teach them some English words, but we'll have a Bible verse and a Bible time. It'll be another opportunity for us to share American culture and through that, the gospel, or just to share the Bible. We often have just a straight gospel message uh, at those events. And this is me at one of the English day camps that we hosted with another missionary, uh, sharing the gospel uh, with a group of Japanese people. I took this picture right before we came back. This is Shiloh's classmate, Sunhisekun, and his dad. 
And every day the kids walk to school together, they line up, and sometimes the parents of the younger kids will go with them. And so we got to know Sunehisukun's dad. They had lived near us for over two and a half years at this point, but we hadn't met him yet. Through that, we were able to meet him, invite him and his wife out to an English day camp. They heard the gospel for the first time, and the senior missionary is on him to come back. And every time he sees him, oh, I know, I know, I need to come to church, but uh, I have work on Sunday or something like that. So we're praying that he will, uh, the gospel he's heard on multiple occasions, uh, will begin to take a root in his life through the Spirit's work. Here's another young man that we had in our home, uh, Kanta-san. He was from, originally from the Osaka region, moved up for a three-month period to come work in our city. I met him through basketball. So early on we recognized that because the men are working so long, I didn't have a way to interact with them or meet them. And so I'm tall, and so everybody would ask me if I played basketball. So I just, I don't really play basketball. I'm not very good at it. So I just started playing basketball. And through that I met a lot of young men in their 20s and 30s. And we were able to have them into the home, invite them out to church. And so it was a great way to connect with people. Um, and I had never done in that sort of ministry stateside. But as a missionary, you kind of say, how can I meet people? And then those people I meet, how do we make a friendship? And then how do we introduce the gospel through that friendship and invite them out to church? And that's that process there. So what's next? Our fourth goal, you probably don't remember back, it's early in the morning, was to find a city and start a Bible study. And I won't read that for you since I've read the last three Japanese ones. Um, but that was something that I was doing months before we returned. I was traveling all over our prefecture, which would be kind of like a state. Um, but think more like east, northeast coast, you know, New Jersey, Maryland-sized states, looking for a suitable location for our new church plant. And you see the picture there. That is the Tokyo area. 40 million people. I think, okay, I do have, I think this one might play. Yeah, okay. So this gives you a little, oh, that was just a short clip. Let me see if it goes any further. Okay, yeah. So that's the Tokyo area. So if you can imagine that, and you're looking through that for a place to plant a church. And really, if you go... The ocean's on this side, but if you go in kind of like a 180, that's the view you get all the way out to the mountains. Just so many people stacked in there. And our goal is to find a city that has, you hear about it in our presentation tonight, good access to the highway and to the train system so that we can get people in to where our church is. We need a little bit of land. So this is what, let's see here, this is what land looks like for sale in Japan. Uh, this is actually a large parcel of land in Japan. In Japan, um, an eighth of an acre is, is a good piece of property in the cities there. So obviously if we want to do a good ministry, I think they say here in the States you need an acre at least for a small ministry. But we need some land. So we'll be a little bit more out in the suburbs for that. And the reason why is right now we have a seminary and a Bible school um, that I'm currently the president of. And that particular school is meeting kind of in like a Sunday school room that's the size of maybe a large bedroom. And we would like to build a new building where we can move that into the new building and then have a place for our literature creation and distribution. We also want to host pastors' regional fellowships uh, from our seminary grads. They like to get back together and meet up, and that's a great way for them to encourage one another. A lot of single bivocational pastors who are working hard, lonely ministries, and we want to provide opportunities for fellowship. And then the public school system is very, especially once you get into third grade, antagonistic to a Christian worldview. So we found a lot of Christians have begun homeschooling in Japan, and that's a very new thing. They don't have Christian schools like we have here in America. So a lot of moms are trying to figure that out as they go. So we'd like to provide opportunities for those homeschoolers to get together uh, and kind of talk with one another to fellowship the young kids, especially if you're outside the school, you don't have a lot of fellowship. The schools are really the way kids get to know one another. And so that's kind of our goal. And uh, we have two cities in mind, but when we go back, we're going to see if we can find a couple more to choose from as we look to plant that church. So here's one of those cities. The, the top left is where we are currently and about 44 minutes away by train. There's another area we found with some land that might be a potential just north of Tokyo there. And then we have one other area which is about an hour and a half uh, from where we're at uh, in the southern part of Kanagawa Ken, which is kind of a neighbor of Saitama and Tokyo. And so you can be in prayer for us as we try to make that transition to new ministry work and all the different logistics that are involved in that. And this is what I was doing, going around to different cities like this. You take the train, you'd look out from the train station and see, okay, do they have public access? What does it look like? Then you'd walk around the city to make sure they have young people because uh, Japan has a very aged population. I think they're predicting a third of the country is going to be over 50, or I'm sorry, over 65 
by 2050. Uh, so we want a, country, a city that has some young people so when we move in, the city doesn't die around our ministry there. Uh, so those are our second term goals, solidify language and cultural knowledge. So we have a base. We just want to make sure we continue to grow in that so we can grow in ministry effectiveness. Find that new city and start a Bible study in it and begin looking for land. We'll be working with another young couple, the Gonnermans, and then we'll go ahead and build that new church plant, planting center. And I put this picture up here at the end because it kind of um, describes what it's like to minister in Japan. There's a lot of similar and different things. So this is us when we first arrived in Japan on our way back from a Costco run. So maybe some of you go down Woodruff, you brave Woodruff to go to Costco every once in a while and you come back with everything you do that you get from there. And depending upon how busy Woodruff is, the time can be a long time there. But this is us. It was about an hour away to Costco. We're thankful we had Costco there in Japan. Uh, the food is very expensive and that provided us a way to get some. Uh, but we had to do it by train with a car seat, and you would just load as much as you could in there, and you'd go back. It was an hour one way, an hour back. And so that was our first. So there's a lot of things that are familiar, because obviously Costco is familiar, but a lot of things that are different when you minister cross-culturally. You have to discern what's same, what's different, and how do I minister to people in that context. I think this is my last, yeah, last slide. So if we could cut the screen here. I'm not sure how to do that. I have about three minutes left. So I might save some of what I wanted to say this morning for the message this evening and open it up for any questions. Does anybody have any questions about us, ministry, Japan, life, anything of that nature that you'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Go for it. Yes, so slippers are slip-on, and a lot of people wear kind of what I'm wearing right now, which is like the old-style loafers you can't see, but that would be the common school uniform for high schoolers. And then you'll see a lot of people with smash down heels. So that's, we had to keep getting after my son because he would just smash down his heels to go in and out of the house. What was the second question? The second one is uh, for burial. If Christians from different paths come together and pray for the burial, Yes, that's a good question. So cremation is something that we have to deal with in Japan. By law, everybody has to be cremated. Our uh, camp in the north actually has a grave site where we're allowed to bury people. Um, but most Christians choose cremation and are buried that way in a Christian graveyard. So there are two kind of ways people get buried. One is they buy, the church will buy a piece of uh, grave site in a Buddhist temple and they'll make this their church grave site in that kind of Buddhist temple grave area and they'll, and they'll plant that. The other way is there are maybe a handful of Christian burial sites all over Japan, which our church chose to bury our people in. And it was a two and a half hour trip one way to get there. Uh, and that's an important part of their culture. They have a remembrance of the dead. And so every year we have a memorial service at the gravesite to provide kind of the Christian alternative to that, where we go and remember the people who've gone before us in their Christian testimony rather than worshiping them and inviting them back into our homes. So it is a very real problem there in Japan. Uh, and we have to think through biblically how do we handle this with each of the individuals in the churches there. Good questions. Go ahead. Yes, that's the real challenge um, because people will say, well, you're Christian because you're American, so of course you're Christian. Uh, and it really takes time. So here in America, a lot of people have a quasi-Christian background, and that was part of what I was going to talk about this morning. From Acts 17, you see Paul, when he goes into uh, a synagogue and preaches to the Jewish people, he starts with Messiah and works them from Messiah uh, to the cross. Uh, who is Messiah? Here's Christ. Let me show you from prophetically how Christ is the one who answers all these. For us, we have to start a little bit more like he did on Mars Hill with who is this unknown God that you don't know? You've got lots of gods here, but who is this unknown God? What is he like? What makes him unique and different from what you're currently worshiping? Uh, and why is he a universal God, not just a national God? Uh, and we're noticing as well, obviously, post-World War II, the emperor denounced him being a, uh, a god. And so that has opened up the door uh, for people to be a little bit more open to other religions. Uh, but yeah, that is a real challenge. We have to really work with the people and explain what Christianity is, how it's not tied to America. I know it goes back to creation, Adam, and the sin, and then through the, the nation of Israel, how God preserved the line for Christ. So it just takes a little bit longer, and there's a Bible study we've worked through that explains that. All right, I think we're out of time at this point. If you have any other questions, please feel free to stop by our table. Love to see you there. Is it all right if I close in prayer, Cameron? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace to each one of us this morning and that through Christ we have hope of the resurrection. 
Father, as we talk through Japan and the many millions there that don't know your Son as Savior, we pray that the gospel would have free reign, hearts would be open to the truth, and thank you, Father, for this church and their faithful prayers in the way that you've already worked in Japan through those prayers for people who would never have heard the gospel were it not for the p- prayers of your people empowering your ministers in Japan. Pray that you give us a good rest of the morning here as we worship you and learn from your word. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much.